Hello and welcome to Robotic Surgery Insights. I'm excited to be joined today by Christian Espinoza, CEO of Blue Goat Cyber. Thanks for joining me today, Christian. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. I'm glad to be here. So you're fast becoming a prominent figure in the surgical robotic space. So I'm sure several of our audience already know your story. But for those that don't, could you please tell us a bit about yourself? Sure, I'll try to hit the highlights. Um, I grew up extremely poor in Arkansas in a single wide trailer on a government cheese and powdered milk and food stamps with a drug addicted mother. And I worked hard to escape Arkansas. So I applied to every scholarship I could. I got a scholarship to the Air Force Academy. So I was in the Air, US Air Force for about six years. I did communications. And that's where I first learned about cybersecurity. I wanted to fly jets, but they cut all the pilot slots. My favorite movie is Top Gun. So that's why I wanted to fly jets. So after I left the Air Force, I worked for the Department of Homeland Security and did, did uh, Department of Defense contracting work. Then I joined a commercial company where I tested commercial aircraft. I tried to hack into commercial aircraft and drones to make sure they were secure. And along those lines, I did 24 Ironman triathlons. I climbed a couple of the seven summits. And I <clears throat> started my first cybersecurity business, Alpine Security. I sold that in 2020. And then in 2022, while I was working for the parent company, I developed six blood clots in my left leg and almost died. But thanks to a medical device, uh, I was quickly diagnosed and I'm still here. So then after recovering from those blood clots, I decided to form Blue Goat Cyber and focus purely on med tech. In my first company, we did med tech cybersecurity, but it wasn't our primary focus. So... Our primary focus now with Blue Goat Cyber is MedTech Cybersecurity, and I feel like that is my purpose in life because if it wasn't for a medical device, I wouldn't be here. You have by far the coolest story of anyone we've ever spoken to. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I've also written a couple of books along the way and a few other things, but I just try to hit the highlights. Well, so tell me about the books, and then we can talk about cybersecurity. Uh, one of my books is called The Smartest Person in the Room. It's really about the challenges in cybersecurity with highly rationally intelligent individuals that want to be smarter than everybody, which inhibits communication and collaboration. Because when you're always trying to be smarter than somebody, uh, you're finding ways to talk over someone's head or to prove somebody wrong, typically. And I think that is the biggest problem in cybersecurity. So the book is really about raising emotional intelligence in the industry. So if I feel like if we can raise the emotional intelligence, the EQ with already high IQ individuals, then our whole industry will improve. And my second book is more of a focus memoir about balancing, chasing big goals. I call them the macro goal versus the micro things right in front of you. Because for me, I used to put blinders on and be so hyper-focused on this massive goal, like doing the seven summits or completing the Ironman triathlon or whatever it is that I would just ignore everything right in front of me. So my relationships would fall apart. My health would fall apart sometimes. My wealth would dwindle. And I realized if I had paid more attention to what was right in front of me, that maybe I'd realize that that goal I thought I wanted to go after, I really didn't even want to go after it. And then I also found that when I got to the goal, I was automatically thinking about the next goal. And it was never fulfilling. It was like a, my own little rat race. So I'm trying to like have more of a balance in life. I think a lot of us are guilty of this. <laughs> a lot of us, a lot of people that are higher achievers are certainly guilty of that. Yes. And we try to rationalize it to ourselves and say, this is the most important thing is to, you know, make this much money or tick this box. But along the way, you're not fulfilled. And I think there's, a, you have to have that balance. So you started Blue Goat Cyber in 2022 and now you're everywhere. Could you please tell us a little bit about the journey that you've been on with the business? I leveraged what we already did in my former company. As I mentioned, we did Al we did MedTech Cybersecurity with Alpine Security, and I started that company in 2014. So we've been doing MedTech Cybersecurity since 2014, a little over uh, 10 years now. So I leveraged everything I knew from that company with Blue Goat Cyber, not just the MedTech Cybersecurity portion, but also the how to build a business aspect. I feel like in the first company, I paid a lot of the, the dumb tax, as they say. I made like every mistake possible. So I'm trying to leverage what I learned in this company. And my goal is to become the market leader in med tech cybersecurity. 
Uh, and that's what we're working on. Excellent. And thinking about cybersecurity, specifically for surgical robotics companies, what would you say are some of the biggest cybersecurity threats that these types of companies are facing today? I think there's two main threats. Uh, number one is a lack of awareness. And this is a, a problem across the industry, not just related to surgical robots, but pretty much every type of med tech innovation is in general, people don't know what they don't know about cybersecurity. So part of Blue Goat's mission is to raise that awareness because a lot of companies don't consider cybersecurity until right before a submission, a pre-market submission for FDA clearance, as an example. And if they wait to the very end, it becomes very costly and it delays the submission and it delays time to market. It frustrates everybody. So our goal is to try to raise that awareness so people consider cybersecurity at the beginning and make it like requirements into the design of the robot or the system. That is one of a one of the challenges is that lack of awareness. And the second one is hospital networks. We consider hostile networks. So a surgical robot that's deployed to a hospital network, if it connects to the hospital network in any aspect, it could be wireless, it could be wired. Uh, it is connecting to a hostile network because pretty much every hospital network we have tested has already had malicious actors on it, or we've been able to fully compromise it. So you have to design the device with the consideration that it's going into an unsafe environment. I would say those are the, the two biggest one. If I have to give a third, a third um, threat facing surgical robotics companies today, I, I would say it's, Every interface on the device needs to be fully secure because we've had a few clients that say this USB port on the robot is only used for maintenance. And that might be the, the normal use case, but what if somebody that is not from the manufacturer plugs something in, into that USB port and tries to hack into it? So we have to look at like that aspect as well. Like every interface, every entry point is going to be considered from an attack perspective uh, for your submission to the uh, FDA or EUMDR or wherever you're trying to get your device approved. So I think you mentioned a moment ago, probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest mistakes you see surgical robotics companies make when it comes to their cybersecurity in terms of thinking about it too late. What are some of the other common mistakes you see them make? Yeah, that, that's uh, one of the main ones is is waiting to the very end. Uh, the FDA and other regulatory authorities want to see what's called a secure product development framework, which means you have a framework to securely develop your product. So that means cybersecurity is part of your development process, not bolted on at the end. So that's extremely important. And that's not just for the initial release of the, the robot or the device. It's also for the update. So how do you securely develop an update as well? And how do you deploy that update securely? Because the other concern is once these devices are fielded, if there is a new vulnerability discovered, how do we mitigate that vulnerability with a fielded device? And that could be an over the air update. It could be a field technician goes to the device and plugs a USB, USB stick in and updates it that way. So that whole process needs to be secure. And I would say the other common mistake is not really understanding all the entry points. I kind of alluded to this before with a USB example, um, but basically when you have a device, you have to do a threat model and the threat model should outline every entry point into that device. This could be Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, it could be even your software bill of materials. If you borrowed a third party library that might have a vulnerability. So you have to look at all these ways that a vulnerability could be exploited in your device and then make sure that those are properly mitigated and the risk is, the risk is at an acceptable level. So we can't harm a patient if somebody were to get into one of those entry points in the device. Some really interesting insights there. Could you please expand on how Blue Goat Cyber supports surgical robotics companies? And what would you say really makes you different compared to other cybersecurity companies out there? 
Yeah, we support um, surgical robotic companies in three main ways. Uh, the first way is what we call secure med tech design consulting. So when a innovators just starting to work on the design, we can help them with that design because sometimes people need to choose hardware components that make up the robot. And if they choose the wrong microcontroller, as an example, then that could cause problems later on because that microcontroller may not support the security features needed to get cleared by the FDA, as an example. So we can help them with that very early on with the design and the requirements. We also help with pre-market submission. So ideally somebody comes to us at least six months before their submission timeline to get their device cleared. And we can help them with all the documentation, all the testing, all the analysis, all the risk assessment, and work with them to mitigate the things we discover, the vulnerabilities we discover. And then the third component is once the device is cleared or on the market, we do post-market management. So we do an annual test against the device. We have a platform where we monitor the software bill materials for new vulnerabilities. We monitor various sources to make sure an existing vulnerability hasn't changed from a exploitation profile. And we help with, with all of that. So we, we set that up for the manufacturer. We basically manage everything post-market. And if there's a new vulnerability, we help triage that and determine if it's actually going to be high risk or low risk and what should be done about it as well. And then I think the second part of your question was, um, how are we different to uh, other cybersecurity companies? Uh, we're very different because we specialize in med tech and med tech is very nuanced compared to what I call traditional cybersecurity. Uh, is highly regulated with the FDA, uh, EUMDR, and the risk is looked at in terms of patient safety. Traditional cybersecurity, the risk is typically looked at in terms of information disclosure, like did someone steal your credit card information? And to me, that's like not that big of a deal. I mean, it's an inconvenience, but from a med tech cybersecurity perspective, if somebody hacks into a surgical ro robot and that robot is performing surgery in your spine, they can paralyze you. So the risk is much greater. And what the regulatory authorities are looking for is much different than traditional cybersecurity. As an example, the FDA wants three deliverables in terms of a penetration test. There's the test plan, the test cases, and the test report. Uh, traditional cybersecurity, there's just a test report. And also, as another example, the FDA wants us to look at exploitability in a risk matrix instead of probability. They want it to be more objective than subjective. So if somebody else were to repeat the same test, they would come up with the same results. So I would say like that is one of the ways we're very different is we focus purely on med tech cybersecurity. So we understand all the nuances and what each regulatory authority wants. And then uh, we've been doing this for 10 years. So we have a very refined process and we have a hundred percent success rate. We've never done a submission that has not passed the FDA or EUMDR on the first round. We ha we've never got anything rejected from them. So we have a, a very high success rate and we've done over 150 submissions at, the, at this point. For surgical robotics companies that perhaps haven't worked with a cybersecurity company before, what does a typical project look like with Blue Goat Cyber? It depends on the type of project. Most of our projects are pre-market submissions, uh, typically 510K submissions in the United States for the FDA. So what that looks like is we have a discovery call, we scope the project, we do fixed fee pricing. So once we understand the scope, we offer a fixed fee bid. Once the client signs the contract, we do a kickoff um, meeting and we manage the whole project using project management PMI standards. And after that kickoff, we typically gather all the documentation. We start creating the documentation required for, gather the documentation from the manufacturer and we start creating the documentation for the cybersecurity submission and start doing the testing. And then whatever we find through our analysis and testing, we work with the manufacturer to, to fix that. We tell them how to fix it. And if they have questions, um, we help them fix it. We're, we're basically their partner until their device gets cleared and we're on um, side by side with them until the device gets cleared. 
And then once the device gets cleared from a pre-market perspective, we typically roll over to the post-market management contract, which is an annual contract. And the, the, the biggest challenge in that process is how long it takes the manufacturer to fix things we identify. Uh, we've been able to start a pre-market submission and finish it in three weeks time frame if the manufacturer can fix things very quickly. Uh, but then if people wait to the very end to come to us, uh, like there's one client of ours, we found 2,500, 2,500 things they had to fix. And it took them eight months to fix it. So the sooner somebody comes to us, the better. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they wanted to submit in two months. So it delayed the submission by six months. And you can imagine the the, the cost involved with that. And that's why we're advocating people consider cybersecurity very early on because it ends up costing a lot less. How do you see cybersecurity evolving in the next, say, five to 10 years? Well, I hope it evolves. Uh, I, I think that awareness is slowly changing where people are understanding that manufacturers understand that they need to consider cybersecurity early on. I think the other aspect that we have to look at is the effect of AI. And everyone thinks AI is great. It is great. It does enhance a lot of things, but AI opens up a whole another door of cybersecurity risk. So having a good handle on that, and I know there's some guidance that the FDA has released on that and other organ like the EUMDR has released, some EU's released guidance on AI as well. I think having that under control and some controls in place to help with AI is, is going to be one of the biggest challenges. Because there's, there's a big, at least in the US, there's a big push with AI. And there's this assumption that AI is safe and all that, but AI can be drastically and dramatically abused by malicious actors uh, for, for pretty much every type of system, including surgical robots and even in vitro diagnostic systems. So I think that's going to be our biggest challenge. And with surgical robots, I, it's the, the challenge also is, you know, for, if we're using a surgical robot for telemedicine, uh, if I'm performing the surgery remotely, I should say, not telemedicine, but it's a remote surgery, we have to consider the connection between as well to make sure there's no latency there. Because if there's latency, it could affect the the uh, surgery also. And I live in Phoenix, Arizona area right now, and they're not really surgical robots, but we have autonomous driving cars here. It's kind of the same thing because we're moving towards autonomous surgical robots that just do the surgery by themselves without a physician. Right now, there's a physician involved or a surgeon. And I often think like, what if this car was compromised and I'm driving in it, it's an autonomous driving car, it could speed up to 150 miles an hour, run into a telephone pole uh, and kill me, right? So it's the same concept with a surgical robot because it is connected, even though nobody's using it, no, you know, there's nobody like driving it, it is still connected somehow. So somebody could still compromise it. So I think as we move along, that's that's, that's a major concern because there's not someone that can jump in and take over the robot anymore if it's doing it fully autonomously. Interesting. And my final question for you is, what advice would you give to engineers or executives at the surgical robotics companies that are just starting to think about their security? I think if they're just starting to think about cybersecurity, it's worth having just a conversation with some experts. Like my team, we're happy to get on a call like for 45 minutes or an hour and answer questions and see if they have cybersecurity under control, if there's some gaps that they need full, um, filled and just help guide and provide some free advice because our mission is to help manufacturers get their devices to market. And cybersecurity has been a big roadblock. So if there's any way we can help remove that roadblock, with a quick conversation, you know, we would love to do that and offer that for any any engineer or executive at a surgical robot company. You know, they're happy to discover to schedule a discovery call with us and we can offer some help wherever we need. Thank you very much for your time. It's been great speaking with you. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it.